Intel's Pentium G line has largely managed to hold on as one of the better buys of the past few years. There was a brief period where the G3258 made a lot of sense for ultra budget minded buyers, and then the G4560 recently, particularly at the actually good price of $60. And now Intel has its Pentium G5000 series rebranded as Pentium Gold. The G4560 had stunted growth from limited stock and steep hikes on MSRP, forcing people to consider i3s instead, up until R3s from AMD shift. The 4560 remained a good buy as it dropped towards $60, fully capable of gaming on the cheap, but is now being replaced by the units we are reviewing this month. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks-focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. We're starting with our gaming benchmarks of the G5600. This is the most expensive of the Intel Pentium Gold series. The Gold doesn't really mean anything. It's basically the version of the Pentium line that we would buy as DIY PC builders. But the G5600 is what we're looking at. That's $95. That makes it $40 more than the modern day price G4560, which is just under 60 bucks. And it's about $10 more than the 5500, $20 more than the 5400, and the R3 1300X is roughly 10-ish dollars more at $105 on average, with the R3 1200 at $95. So it's a really dense class to compete in. And at one point, the Intel Pentium lines were pretty much uncontested here, other than when the Athlon X4 CPU is shipped, but those have been few and far between. Now there's a lot more competition. For the G5600, we're looking at a dual core quad thread CPU at 3.9 gigahertz, no boost, and with four megabytes of L3 cache. Maximum memory support is officially listed at 2400 megahertz, and using an appropriate motherboard would further limit that to 2400 megahertz. These CPUs make the most sense to pair with non Z series motherboards, as you really won't gain any of the benefit from a Z series board. The 5500 is mostly the same thing, except 100 megahertz slower. The 5400 is 200 megahertz slower at 3.7 gigahertz, with maximum graphics frequency also slowed down by about 95 megahertz if you use the IGP. So other than just outright DGPU coupled performance and gaming, the only major difference between the Pentiums and the R3 CPUs, and architecturally, is the existence of an integrated graphics processor on the Intel Pentium processors. So if you're gonna use that for some reason, maybe you're not really doing any gaming or at least not anything serious or even esports like, then I guess maybe that's something to note. But for our testing purposes, we're looking at these as products you would pair with a cheap DGPU, like a GT1030, which we did in some tests. And then we pair it with the 1080 Ti and others, obviously just to eliminate GPU bottlenecks because that's how you test processor differences. Let's get the test bench up on the screen. We're focusing on gaming benchmarks only today with a couple of power benchmarks at the end. These aren't really CPUs you'd use with Blender or anything like that, so we're not even gonna bother looking at those results. The test bench is sponsored by Corsair is using an AX1600i power supply and a kit of 3200 megahertz memory. However, we drop that memory down to 2400 megahertz for purposes of testing the Pentium line CPUs because that's the frequency you would use with them. Sure, you could put it with a Z-series board. Sure, you could get better memory support, but why would you do that? Uh, so we're testing with it in the configuration that we assume most users would use the processor. And we also have data for i3s and uh, G4560, thing like that with the lower memory speeds as well. So this exits our standardized 3200 megahertz memory testing with CPU reviews. But again, it, this is a scenario where real world makes more sense to focus on. Uh, so let's get into the numbers for this. We're using H series motherboards rather than Z series. And more information as always will be in the article link in the description below if you have questions about the testing platform. We're starting with Civilization VI turn time benchmarks first, as it's a unique metric that reflects specifically on CPU performance. We run a benchmark that has five turns until our next turn, and for the G5600, each turn averages 16.3 seconds with a 2400 MHz kit of memory. That's among the worst three numbers we've seen since Civilization's update, which means that you're looking at about one minute and 20 seconds between each turn. For perspective, the fastest performer, the overclocked 8700K, 
sees turn time drops to about 51 seconds when multiplied by five turns. In other words, to be very simple about this, with Civilization VI, if we click end turn with the 5600, we wait about a minute and a half for our next turn. With the stark contrast 8700K, we'd wait just under a minute for the next turn, meaning our next play. Compared more reasonably to its predecessor Pentium G4560 with 2400 MHz memory, the 5600 operates at a time reduction of 7.2%. The 5600 also operated at roughly equivalence with our R3-1300X stock CPU, overclocking it would place it ahead of the G5600, naturally. The i3-7300 operated just slightly faster at 15.9 to 16 seconds, and would be similar to the 8300 that we haven't yet retested. GTA 5 isn't particularly friendly to the Pentium CPUs, although it's still plenty playable. We're clearly running into GPU bottlenecking at this point, operating at 82 FPS average with the 5600, versus a maximum possible 152 FPS average with our GPU bottlenecked 8700K and 8600K 5 gigahertz results. So the 5600 is limiting our GPU here. It is the bottleneck. The G5600 still manages to outperform the 4560 by 17%, a remarkable uplift, and is roughly matched with the i3-7300 in average 1% and 0.1% lows. The R3-1300X operates 8.5% faster in average FPS, with no meaningful difference in frame time performance. That's about 1% per dollar extra spent on the 1300X. Not a bad uplift if considering the Ryzen alternative. At 1440p, it's about the same result. The only thing that changes is the top end performance because we've been completely bottlenecked on the CPU at the low end and we remain bottlenecked at the high end by the GPU just because it's already a high end CPU. The more intensive GPU scenarios of 1440p just don't matter for something like a G5600 where we're limited anyway to around 80 FPS average. Assassin's Creed Origins is an intensive game for these CPUs to sustain and is our next one. We finally get some values dipping below 60 FPS average for the Pentium CPU. We're down to 55 FPS average for the G5600, outpacing the 4560 by 11.7%, with the 7300 ahead by 3%. The R3-1300X gains in a big way, outperforming the 5600 by 16% in average FPS, and outperforming it significantly in 1% low frame time performance. Performance is similar at 1440p as shown here. We have some differences that are within variance, but that's about it. Let's move on to Watch Dogs 2. Watch Dogs 2 at 1080p has us at 50 FPS average with lows reasonably behind at 39 and 33 FPS 0.1% lows. The G5600 runs about 13% faster than the 4560's 44 FPS average. Again, a somewhat remarkable gain. The 7300 is at rough equivalence with the 5600 and the R3-1300X pulls ahead by 14% with its 56 FPS average. Lows aren't improved in a meaningful way with the Ryzen CPU, but the average FPS certainly improves significantly, and that's for about a $10 to $15 price bump. Not bad. As expected, 1440p results post the same values for the low end. Nothing changes in the chart here. We'll just skip along to the next chart. Ashes of the Benchmark is next and remains one of the most threat-intensive games. Put air quotes around that word. And this one, we're treating like a synthetic test. The G5600 at 1080p pushed 21 FPS average, marking it a bit ahead of the 4560 and a bit behind the 7300. The R3-1300X operated at 23.6 FPS average for a lead of about 10%. Project Cars should favor the Pentium CPUs a bit more than Ashes did. For this game, the G5600 lands at 78 FPS average and plays reasonably well. It's doing fine. The 7300 outperforms it by about 2%, and the G4560's 69 FPS average is outperformed by the 5600 by 13%. Although not appreciable, the G5600 also does better lows than the G4560. The R3-1300X manages 85 FPS average, with lows also advantaged, but again, not particularly user appreciable. The lead is about 9% for the R3 in this one. Finally, for low-end games, we're mostly comparing versus the likes of the AMD APUs when using a GT1030 for the Pentium processors. This puts pricing as similar to the R5-2400G, or close enough to be comparative. With a GT1030, the G5600 plays Rocket League at high settings and 1080p with an average FPS of 64. We're becoming bound by the hardware, clearly, because you can look at other results and see higher performance. The result ties us with the G4560 roughly, the overclocked R3-1200, and the APUs. Dota 2 shows similar CPU limitations. The G5600 leads everyone else, 
even though overclocked R3, but that's partly because Dota 2 shows strong favor toward Intel. It's frequency and IPC intensive. Finally, for some perspective, it's only fair that we look at power consumption numbers at the EPS 12 volt rails, and for Cinebench multi-threaded, the G5600 is the lowest power consumption device we've tested lately, for CPUs anyway. It's operating at about 26 watts on the H370 motherboard, with the next lowest device at 40 watts for the R3-1300X stock CPU. The 8350K stock CPU operated at 46 watts. Single-threaded power consumption in Cinebench is up against the limitations of our test resolution at about 15 watts for the G5600 single-threaded. 3DMark physics testing is our gaming stand-in and shows a 21-watt consumption at the EPS 12 volt rails. That's significantly lower than the 38-watt 1300X and the 34-watt 8350K. Given the average difference in gaming performance, it seems fair that the G5600 operates behind the 1300X when we see these power consumption metrics. Recapping all of that then, at $40 more than the G4560, it makes sense that we're seeing the performance differences we are. The differences between a 4560 and a 5600 are significant, in some cases, double digit percentages, and that's a lot. So the $40 makes sense. And in a vacuum where we're just comparing previous Intel to current Intel, it's not a bad jump. It is a big jump in price, but the performance gain is actually there. It's not a vacuum though. Intel has other products and AMD now has products that are actually very competitive in this space, including APUs, as we showed in the low-end gaming test, where the APUs do exceptionally well, uh, very well. Uh, you end up bottlenecked by other components in a cheap DGPU system anyway. So an APU might make more sense depending on what you're trying to build. The R3-2200G, all costs tallied, is a really affordable processor for gaming and can do some graphics as well. It's good enough for all the esports titles we test. It's good enough for CSGO, Dota 2, Rocket League, Overwatch, all those kinds of games at reasonably high settings. So if that's the kind of game you're playing, just buy the R3 2200G. Don't worry about the 2400G. Don't worry about a Pentium and a cheap DGPU. The 2200G is exceptional for what it does at its price. It is pretty cheap though. So if you do have the budget for something better, we'd encourage you to spend it because you will get, at this price class, you get significantly bigger gains for every extra 10 or $20 you spend. It scales that rapidly at the low end. So if you can afford more, do it, but consider that the R3 1300X, or I guess the 1200 if you overclock it, are very competitive with the 5600 when you consider the price. What's really going to be the question is how do the 5400 and 5500 perform, which we also will be testing soon, because these are the ones where they're 10 or $20 cheaper than the 5600. The 5600's biggest weak spot is being 10 bucks away or even equivalent from the R3 series CPUs. And those actually are very competitive at gaming at the price point. It's no longer the case where Intel is just flat out the best at gaming. Sure, at the high end, absolutely. The 8700K, pretty much uncontested, especially considering overclocking. But these CPUs, the frequency is low enough on them, being sub four gigahertz in pretty much all cases here, that yeah, they run really close to R3s. And R3s have potentially advantages in some of the performance metrics. As we saw, low double digits for some of them, high single digit percentages for other games. So R3 is looking really compelling right now. And previously we liked the G4560 so much because at $60, which is what it sold at today and what it always should have been sold at, but wasn't, at $60, the 4560 is so far away from R3 CPUs and APUs that if you're trying to build the cheapest possible thing, a 4560 with an appropriately non-mining world priced GT1030 at say 70 bucks, which is what it should be, would be a crazy good build for an ultra budget gaming PC. But if you're looking higher classes of price than that, and with the GPU market the way it is, uh, the 5600 just looks kind of like it's a, an unconvincing buy. It's hard to recommend it. So here's what we'll do. For now, if you have a really strict budget, still consider a 4560 with a cheap DGPU. That's still a good combo. Or consider the R3 2200G. We have charts for all of them. Go look at our 2200G and 2400G gaming benchmarks to get details on the performance there uh, and make your decision on which one you want. If you're trying to spend more than that, we would say for now, pass on the 5600, unless you really want that IGP, which is valid, 
and get an R3 instead, or wait for our 5400 and 5500 benchmarks and see if those offer better value for the 10 or $20 minus that you get from the 5600, at which point you're creating enough of a price gap between the R3s that there might be a price reason you would buy the lower end Pentiums. But the 5600 is just far too close to price with the R3s, and we're seeing enough of an advantage with the R3s in some of these games that is, we just don't recommend it right now. So it's interesting. It's very interesting because Intel for a while now, much to their own chagrin, has had a really good product for low-end Pentium. The 4560, 3258, although limited in its use cases for that one, they were good products for ultra-budget PC builds. But Intel sort of stunted the growth of the 4560 by not making enough of them. Prices were too high. And now they come out with a new line and it's just not as impressive as it used to be so far. We still have two more to look at. So that's, uh, it's sort of disappointing, but it does show that AMD is making gains in the market for budget CPUs for gaming. And that's a very good thing to have that competition there. So uh, check back soon, subscribe for the follow-up benchmarks of the other two processors. As always, go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our 3D teardown logo cubes, the Gamers Nexus anti-static mod mat for building systems on or doing PC mods, and go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.